I disagree. I don't think it's the parties that are stopping Obama. Always remember, he who has the money calls the shots, and the U.S. government has no money. Where do they get their money? The Federal Reserve, which is a small little group of bankers in the private sector. You know what I think they did to Barack Obama? I think he got in office and they showed him the Zabruder film. And they said, see what we can do? You sure? America, when it had high economic growth, it had um, close to 20,000 banks. Yeah. And, and this is how you get economic growth. And as we said earlier, that's also resilient. Looking at the history of central banking and the various asset bubbles created, their revealed preference is obvious. Facilitate a boom, then when that boom goes bust, get more power, more authority. In other words, they are rewarded for the disasters they themselves create. Obviously, we don't need to get into the situation at the moment and the current plan of the powers that be, so to speak. But if one takes an objective view of the situation, then the revealed preference becomes quite clear. Let's begin with the European Central Bank, the ECB. The ECB has been a disaster from day one. It's created asset bubbles, banking crises, massive recessions, vast unemployment, large youth unemployment in Spain and Greece, left, right and centre. The ECB is on a mission to destroy the smaller banks. Basel I, introduced in 88-89, said that, oh, the Basel rules only apply to the internationally active banks. Do you remember that? They did actually not apply to domestic banks. But then the EU, for some reason, um, decided whatever this BS, BSBC Basel committee decides, we're going to make EU law and force all banks to follow. What are the Basel rules? Well, the Basel committee is headquartered at the Bank for International Settlements, the BIS in Basel. The BIS is known as the Central Bank for Central Banks. It has established a series of international standards for bank regulation. Most notably Basel 1, Basel 2, and more recently Basel 3. This regulatory burden is too much for the smaller banks to handle. As a result, they are forced to close or merge with other banks, creating bigger and bigger banks and a more centralized system. This has massive implications for the economy. Remember, banks are the creators of credit, i.e. money, and they can use this for productive purposes. Think about lending to local SMEs or unproductive purposes. Think about creating credit for asset transactions. The bigger the bank, the less sense it makes to loan to SMEs, since the balance sheets involved are so massive. You can even bribe the big banks. They will still not lend to SMEs. It's just not worth their while. I mean, it's quite obvious, you know. If you're a big bank, a uh, balance sheet of um, you know, 2,000 billion pounds, and you want to grow because you're shareholder owned um, by 5%, I mean, you need to increase your balance sheet by billions. Therefore, smaller banks disappear, fewer and fewer bigger banks form, and more credit is created for non-GDP purposes, and you get asset bubbles. Then if, but really when, that bubble pops, there is a crisis, and the central bank can then demand more power. The ECB has implemented various anti-bank policies, and the results are clear. Essentially, since the ECB uh, was created and started business 20 years ago. Since then, um, 4,800 banks have disappeared in the Eurozone alone. In terms of monetary policy, interest rates are not the key tool that central bankers can utilize. Rather, it is the quantity of credit creation. The Bank of Japan, for example, created massive asset bubbles, then tightened credit creation and created recessions. But what was the goal? Well, officially, the structural transformation of the economy. Unofficially, this was a US plan, using the Bank of Japan as their agents to destroy Japan's post-war high growth system. The ideology of the central bankers was always the same. You see, they didn't like the system that was in place in Japan before, because in that high growth system, the central bank played a lower level role. It was receiving orders from the Ministry of Finance at law, the central bank was not independent. It had to work. It had to do what the government told it, what the Ministry of Finance and Practice told it, and it didn't like it. It's obvious Japan was too successful. Japan was highly successful, and the Americans didn't like it. That wasn't really the plan. 
um, so they had to change. Officially, the Americans were advising the Japanese uh, in the 70s and 80s on how to improve their economy. Well, <laughs> Japan was doing so well. Um, and did they really need American advice on how to improve the economy? The overall theme here is centralization versus decentralization. Of course, looking at history, we know what happens when centralization goes too far. We already had that in the past. It's the system, the monetary system of the Soviet Union. There was one bank, one central bank. And that one central bank was the only bank and that created all the money and centrally issued it. Uh, it was also digital currency, a lot of it, some paper, but mostly digital as well. Um, and um, this system was a disaster. In 1978, Deng Xiaoping became the new leader of China. He has been referred to as the architect of modern China. And he concluded, well, we need to decentralize banking. And so when he came to power in 1978, what, what was the key? One of the key things he introduced was he founded thousands of banks, thousands of new banks, local banks, small banks, uh, regional banks, specialized banks all across China and the rest is history. The key battle will be to decentralize power structures to essentially hedge against human nature. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. Therefore, more decentralized structures and value mechanisms will determine how society itself develops. Will we facilitate the holy grail of meritocratic capitalism? Or, well, will it be an Orwellian dystopia? The overarching trend of the 20th century is concentration of power in the hands of the few. That's what we have to keep in mind. We have to work against this. We don't want to have these unaccountable central planners making decisions. We need decentralization. And the solution, therefore, is to maintain public money in the hands of local community banks, decentralize decision making, give local people the power. Mm -hmm.